So thank you all for being here. I'm Daniel, being part of Arendal basically from the start. And I'm going to show you a little bit. This is the vision that we're working on. would love your feedback, your attention. This is the first time ever this is seeing the public light. Uh, so very much hoping to get your feedback and, and thoughts uh, and opinions and suggestions, et cetera, on how to improve this. So the, the idea of Arendal, the, the business model, the, the concept that we've been going towards is this idea of a venture studio building the future of work. And I'm going to tell you a little bit what that means. But first, starting with why did we start it on this journey? Why does it matter for us? And what we're seeing is that human collaboration is fundamentally toxic. Leaders are unhappy. Workers are unhappy. Essentially, the, wor the world of work is broken, and we spend more waking hours at work than with our partners or friends or lovers, than having fun, than enjoying ourselves and so on. And, and I mean that contrast is because really for the, the large majority of people in the planet, work is a chore. It's, it's not a vocation, it's not a passion, it's not a place to grow and enjoy themselves, but it's a tremendous drag and, and it's causing tremendous disappointment, disillusion, and lack of mental health issues and so on. Uh, and also Web3 has made tremendous strides uh, or tremendous attempts trying to fix this. There is still a long way to go, for sure. And while work is broken and we know it's been broken for a while, the studies has are not necessarily recent, there hasn't been a lot of progress. And what we're seeing is that traditional collaboration technologies stop optimizing for the wrong things. Is We're trying to make tasks more and more efficient instead of making teams more effective. And the issue is when people are disengaged, it doesn't matter how much you enable them to complete the task, they just don't wanna complete the task and they don't care. And they're not putting their attention, their passion, their ideas into it. They are mostly looking through the window, texting in their phone, or just cannot wait to get out of work. We have up to 16% of people who are, in average, who are working against the company, who are like, actually have become toxic. And so while we have that tremendously disappointing scenario, then we have the rise of bossware or essentially espionage tools turned against our employees, uh, an issue that's become even worse with remote work. And this exacerbates the problem. The more we try to control people, the more we try to monitor them, use pass keys in the doors, figure out how much time they're spending in the keyboard and so on, the more people feel like cogs in a machine or animals just in just in the road of the avatar and they it's not fundamentally motivating just we just exacerbate that feedback loop however the the fundamentals of collaboration are really changing with the rise of remote and hybrid work with freelancing and the long tail of contribution that obviously is very important in DAOs as we have bounties and these other different systems to leverage the community the, the increased usage of autonomous teams and decentralized organizations, the role that AI is playing, and obviously token incentives and the ownership of and different design uh, systems that we can do for incentivization and ownership that are coming not just to shape, but to really, really disrupt the way we've been working. So what we believe is that in this future that is hyper-connected, that is global that is remote first we're not just going to a small improvement upon how organizations have operated but to fundamentally new models of working and and he said and this is a gigantic market so not only like this small nas nascent dao market or so on uh, but we really believe that there is a big movement where both from the web free angle and the web 2 or more traditional organizations angle we're moving towards a very different future than the way we have been collaborating until now. And, and so our, our thesis where our research is pointing us is that the, the future of work is not solopreneurs nor corporations, but swarms. And what we mean by swarms is network of autonomous teams where people feel intrinsically motivated and where these teams can rapidly contract with one another. They can come together to achieve scale. They, 
because they are small, nimble teams with ownership, with intrinsic motivation, they can also explore new opportunities way faster than traditional corporations can. So it's, an, it's a method that enables more innovation, faster speed, faster route to market, more proximity with customers, but that by coming together, we can also enable economies of scope, essentially that once you have a relationship, you can understand the needs of the counterparty and offer them more and more things to satisfy their needs and as well enables servicing the needs of customers and users at scale. As such, based on this vision or the mission that we're having is to unlock human potential by empowering digital swarms through a modular product ecosystem of swarm tech. And we aim to orchestrate these by Arendal, facilitating the the rise of these modular product ecosystem, facilitating the rise of swarms, facilitating the transition, both of traditional organizations and digital first organizations to move and adopt these frameworks that are already emerging, wanting to happen, but where the fundamental enablers are still missing in many cases. And we aim to do that through this model of the, the venture studio. So. Why Venture Studios and a little bit on a Venture Studio is fundamentally a, a way to go beyond what is incubation. And instead of that, have a group of people that together all are building ventures where you can have expert, the right expertise applied at the right moment. So you can have, for example, an expert designer that comes at the moment that you need an expert designer, does that, that piece of work, and then the venture can mature and move to the next stage where other people work on it. So in the same way that we're seeing the decentralization of larger organizations, this is also moving away from a founder-centric mental, uh, mental model for startups that puts tremendous burden on founders and with all the mental health consequences, dependency on them, and also inequalities that arise from it. And instead of that, moving from a more collective, collaborative model of entrepreneurship. And we already see this, this trend rising even outside of Web3. So we're applying, we're taking these patterns and just applying it to create a structured program to facilitate the emergence of ventures so we can reinvest all the learnings that we get. The, the venture journey that we're thinking is launching a, 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 res, a cohort of research fellowships where we can offer a stipend for aspiring entrepreneurs to dig deep into problems. So it's not only those who can, who have the flexibility of a job that allows them to do this on the side, but they then by consequence have to move slow or those who are financially wealthy and can afford a few months without work, but we wanna democratize the access to research problems and deeply understand them. So we don't have to rush into building solutions, but can really understand what needs to be built. Then the adventure formation program where we can put a little bit of capital in the ventures, but mostly a lot of support from the network of ventures, from the ecosystem, so we can advance how they are developing. Through that, help to develop a, a venture portfolio where we can start to get um, the, these teams to become fully autonomous, running their own ventures and collaborating with others. The more they start to collaborate with others and we are using these to power the thesis of modularity and composability, so that the, this, the modular product ecosystem, essentially how all of these different pieces of software can come together and facilitate more complex value propositions. Because what people need are ways to better organize. They don't need just one tool. They need a way to better organize. And that comes together from bringing multiple tool, tools together. Now, the way for these tools to really work together needs to be that the tool makers themselves need to collaborate and they need to have shared incentives. So that's when we're coming to the venture ecosystem through that we can enable product integrations, cross-selling, and equally starting to, to take some of the components from these ventures, refactor them and make them their own independent ventures that are enabling infrastructure. And the whole thing can evolve into some sort of higher of the future of work for those who are familiar. The, there is a bunch of us here, there is way more, more people to show, uh, but the, the key is that the people that we're gathering around us are those who are really passionate 
about reinventing organizations and creating a better future for work. In, in the last year, since we started really building and transition from just doing pure research, where we are is we have four autonomous teams here, each building a modular product. We have managed to get these solutions used by multiple of the most prominent organizations in Web3. We're slowly starting to, to explore Web2. We are over 30 contributors who are regularly showing up and building this vision. And we're building a brand positioning as Web3 thought leaders. Thanks to sharing open research and sharing insights and sharing learnings all the time. All of these with zero investment raised to date. So we'll soon be preparing for a fundraise to accelerate this vision and bring others and also be able to sustain ourselves and others in working towards this future. To leave you with the thought is that it takes a swarm to build a swarm. So recap, we need cross-venture ownership to incentivize collaboration so we can be intentional about this modularity and composability. We're going to be sharing learnings across these ventures and doing more and more research so we can compound the R&D and offer disruptive solutions rather than the incremental, just focus on individual efficiency that web to tech is stuck at. We believe in small and autonomous teams because that offers a sense of belonging, uh, the, a sense of meaningful impact that you can have, as well as rapid iteration and user centricity. And we leverage an ecosystem of platforms and services so we can focus on product innovation and not only on operations. The invitation for all of you who are not part of Arendau already is to join us. You can do so by starting a venture with us, join with your venture, as long as it's related with this topic, of course, and also to contribute to Arendau itself as a platform, as an ecosystem for ventures. Um, taken way too long to share this. We'll have to cut it down in the future. But if you have any comments, feedbacks, suggestions on how to improve it, you're interested in collaborating, please reach out to us. You know where to find us. We're here and so on. I think that was pretty bang on timing. Thank you very much, Daniel. I'm going to ask to stick with you for a minute, if we can, uh, just to run through some of the things that are happening most recently on r and um, just the H1. 2023 update, things like what, what ventures are involved at the moment, um, where are we at with fundraising, and maybe a little talk about some of the talks that we're hosting and the uh, R&D accelerator, et cetera, as much as you can do in five minutes. I'm really taking one. Yeah, sure. So we started this year as quite a small team since we have had two more ventures started. Um, we'll be showing you a little bit, uh, they'll, they'll be presenting soon after. Uh, we have also significantly grown the, the size of the, the core community, and by that I mean those who are every week contributing to the ventures uh, or to r and itself. Uh, we also started this year with quite a bit of baggage in what had been the core team that started r and and we had uh, fundamentally different visions that despite our efforts escalated into more and more tension, which resulted in a separation of the team. Uh, some contributors left to continue their other pursuits while the team that remained doubled down. As a result of that, we are also a lot more aligned uh, on this vision, those who have started. And let me share a little bit about the theory of how this works, but if you think about an innovation curve and it looks like those bell curves, you will always have a radical edge. People doing something very, very extreme, but that will always be very small. This is, for example, if someone is interested in personal development, this is the people who leaves all their, their, their material possessions, they move to a monastery and meditate all day. It's very radical. It advances that idea of personal development to the extreme, but the amount of people it can impact is very few. However, it is inspirational. On the other side, if you go to the mainstream and you try to, for example, advocate for personal development in a corporation, you're going to have to be a lot more conservative. But because of the scale, you can impact many more people. 
where we're trying to position Arendal is in the middle of these two polarities. We're not right now working on building the post-capitalistic futuristic economy. We really support those efforts. We believe are fantastic. But what we're trying to do is be a little bit in the middle where we can build solutions that are scalable, that are financially sustainable, so more and more people can join these, and where we can leverage the traditional capital flows to help us scale this vision. It's a delicate balancing act, and it will require constant thinking and constant sensing and iteration to make sure that we're staying in the right place. The important message here is that the vision and ultimately the mission is bigger than ourselves, and it will require people on both sides of this divide that are advancing it in their own ways. We seek to collaborate with them and with those who want to position themselves in the same middle point. Ideally, we want to work together and, and join forces. So as such, we are now preparing for a fundraise. Uh, we have now a set of ventures that are starting to show traction. You'll hear more about them soon. And, and so we believe that we're starting to show how these can be a collaborative ecosystem and we can actually build sustainable business models that hopefully can generate revenue, scale, and increase their impact thanks to doing so. Um, the fundraise itself will mean that we'll have to bring a whole other group of stakeholders into our endow and as such we'll have to evolve our governance and finally we'll have the, the opportunity to play with some of the more innovative forms of multi-stakeholder governance that you might have seen myself or others blabbing about in twitter uh, so plenty of exciting opportunities to play but as well plenty of challenges in the road ahead okay thank you daniel um we're going to try and turn now and talk to some of our startups, or allow them to talk to us, I should say. Uh, Katerina uh, from Together Tree, we'd love to start with you, if possible. Um, yeah. So take it away. Um, I'll try to keep it to, or I'll check in about sort of 10 minutes. Perfect. Um, I do have a couple of slides, if because I, I don't know who has seen the platform before, so I could share that. It's not perfect. something extensive um so let me just share my screen as uh while i get this going so together who started as i said last year we had our kickoff and it started with the idea about you know how can we actually create successful communities or other better ways of doing this right now and it was especially focused on um understanding when a community is successful in terms of metrics and what which then leads to once you know if it's successful, yes or no, what type of activity somebody can do to make it more successful if it's not. The larger question behind this is also, well, can we have um, ecosystem metrics? Can we understand how one DAO influences the, or, or, or the other DAO? Can we um, map the whole Web3 ecosystem? And so this kind of um, pick out positive spirals that are ha happening within web tree and can we stop kind of vicious cycles happening but it's kind of the larger visions vision that was happening um we did we we started with research way away a long time ago and published an article on how to measure healthy communities let me just post this one post this on us daniel can be quicker in finding the link and putting it in the chat um all right here it is and uh, so that article and set the basis for what we wanted to build. Um, the team changed a lot. So from the original, I don't know, let's say 10 people who were at, at the kickoff call uh, more like last year, two were main, which is Daniel and I, um, people came and go and that's part of the venture and that's, uh, um, that makes it good because everybody has different skills and the project also has different needs at different times. Uh, we started testing our framework with different communities in uh, September with Aragon and the idea was to just understand are the metrics that we're using actually useful for all, all, all other people and can you go from the number to action. Over time we iterated the framework or we iterated how we're presenting uh, the numbers from a very much academic type of report to something which is more 
in a slight format and easier digestible. And then finally, last year, February, we had the app live. And what happened then very quickly is that we realized our whole back end wasn't built properly. The, the numbers that we presented were inaccurate. And we went back to the drawing board. Um, we, we, we sustained ourselves using grants. Daniel did a lot of work in, in that. Uh, through some lucky encounter in a different community, we got into Texas Web Tree, something that was not planned at all, but that kind of helped us to have the lights on actually throughout the whole spring and summer. We are now at a stage where the data is accurate. If a very large community like Optimism um, wants to join our bot, everything crushes again because we haven't optimized for that. So it goes back to um, the drawing board, seeing how we can also deal with these large clients instead of just saying, you know, we don't want to work with Optimism because you're too big and we can't handle that. So that's kind of like a, like a quick um, rundown about where we are. I went through a couple of slides which show the numbers. Maybe in relation to that, like one thing that happened when we worked, when we started working with, with Together Crew, we wanted to test the usefulness <coughs> of the dashboard. And to do that, you need real data. <coughs> Apologies. And we realized that because we had to work with more data due to problems in Together Crew, uh, in uh, Andau, not everybody wanted to. Sorry, I just need to drink something for a sec. But not, not everybody in and I wanted to give, let us use their data, so their post. So this created an, an interesting conversation around open data and closed data and GDPR and what data can we actually collect or can a community manager use in order to understand the community that they're managing, which is related to the question about who owns the data. So if you're posting something in Discord and you know that this is in the and our server, do you own the data or just now the Discord admin own the data and therefore the Discord admin can decide what happens with the data. So this, uh, while it was a kind of a setback for the team because we couldn't test our tool properly, we learned a lot on the on the privacy side there. Um, why was I going to that direction? Uh, I forgot, but it's it's an important fact that kind of shaped who who Together Crew is and uh, what we're trying to do. Uh, so the tool itself, it is implemented in the Andau server. So everybody who joins Andau, uh, you're consenting for us to analyze your data. And currently only the Discord admin, which means Daniel has access to this data. All the data is, um, well, some data is under, like would tree, for example, so some data can be tracked to a specific person or the data it's harder to track it to, to a specific person. And we are GDPR compliant. So we went, we, we talked with a lawyer to make sure that we're not doing anything shady. Things that you can see, which is you can divide the metrics into individual metrics and community level metrics. And then again, on the in, in individual side, you can see it kind of as Welcoming me members, so how do people join the community? How are they acting when they're part of the community? And what are they doing when they're leaving the community? Uh, and then acknowledging also that some people leave because, well, Arandau isn't for them. So it's not, it, this engagement doesn't have to be a bad thing. Um, so, for example, for onboarding, we can see things like joining, joining, and being active, joining, and still being active instead of joining, making an introduction, and then dropping out. And that for community manager then provides information about is there too much friction in the onboarding process or not enough? Are a lot of people joining and making an introduction but then dropping off directly. So there are different ways you can then use this data. And at the end of it, it helps to better segment and understand community members. And then on the other side, so on the kind of the leaving side, we do acknowledge that uh, life happens. And not everybody is 24 seven in Discord communicating with other community members. And it's actually quite normal for people to disengage for one week or two weeks. Like just imagine if you are on holiday and you decide to be completely on holiday. So then you would not go on Discord. 
And in normal dashboards, you will be counted as a disengaged member, which means like something has to happen. We need to make sure that you come back into the community. But it's actually nothing bad is happening. You are just on holiday, which is perfectly normal and should not make the community man manager uh, worried about what is going on in, in the community. So then the metrics reflect this as our acknowledgement that life happens also outside of Discord or outside of the community you are in. And then what else do we have? Well, we have a social network graph because communities are this. Communities is a web of interaction. If you enter a community and there's no interaction in it, there's directly the assumption that this is a dead place and you will be leaving. So what we're measuring is uh, the space between the people, the relationships. And based on that, we can create these fancy pictures. And for example, this, this is Arndau. And I'm pretty sure everybody can guess who is this dot in the center there, this purple one. Um, Funnily, he's kind of imprisoned by four people who are kind of circling around him, but also having in interactions with him. And then we have a couple of bridges here, the green dot there and the purple dot here. Interesting about bridges, without talking to them, you don't know if they're a bridge builder, which is something good, or a gatekeeper. And that's kind of the limit of this. Like this picture shows you a lot of data, but if you really want to know, you have to talk with people. So while this me, while this looks like, wow, I know now everything, what you're actually just doing is scratching the surface. And numbers only give you the basis. And I really think that like, you need to have the conversation with people in order to really get behind the numbers. Another thing you, you can see in these network graphs are the people in the periphery the edges and then normally community builders are like also in companies where these type of analysis are used to like oh no there's somebody at the edge of the network i need to do something i need to get them into the center they need to be super active like wait 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 if you're at the edge it normally means you're active in a lot of other communities if you're active in other communities it means you know something i don't know which is great for me because then you can give me new ideas. You might come across a tool I, I didn't know, or you might read something that is relevant for me, but because I'm so deep in Arndau, I just didn't hear about it. But because you are at the edge of Arndau, you bring in this new expertise or this, this new knowledge. So again, you need to talk to people to really understand, is it bad that they are at the edge? Uh, I don't know how much time there is, Chris, so please interrupt me. I'm more or less at the end. Mm -hmm. One more minute. Perfect. Uh, traction, we're doing well. Um, got a uh, pocket uh, this week and optimism uh, a couple of weeks ago, which helped us to collaborate together with Mike Pro, who will do a lot of the development for us. And that's it. Amazing. Open for questions. Uh, well, we're going to keep the questions for ends. We're going to go straight on to our turn if we can do so. If you can prepare your presentation, we're going to move on to our turn, who's going to present Harmonica, which is uh, uh, probably the latest startup to join uh, Baron Dow. Over to you. Hey guys, um, hope you can see my screen. All good. Uh, cool. So yes, Harmonic um, only recently joined Arendao. Um, and to be honest, we did we started working on it also very recently, which maybe like less than two months ago. So Harmonica is AI power AI powered a chatbot for super fast sense making and deliberation. Um I've been thinking about problems that we solve, and I, I think the main two problems are like equally important, and they are more important for different like markets. So the first one is more about like large organizations um, who um, basically are struggling with participation rates. Um, Deliberation, thoughtful deliberation is hard to scale. Uh, people feel voiceless. Um, a lot of available insights are missed. So that's something that happens in large companies like Adidas or maybe even um, with some kind of, uh, I don't know, the democratic processes or political action. And the other problem is that in the communities where people are 
more engaged by default, actually collective deliberation is also quite expensive uh, and or slow. Uh, so Arendelle published a great article about this. Uh, if you haven't read it, I wholeheartedly recommend you read it. Um, it's called Decisions in DAOs or something like that. Um, so the problems here are that people avoid conflict and they don't, sometimes they don't want to just argue with each other on a forum. Um, they have limited attention span. Um, even if they write something on the forum or in polis, then you have to spend like weeks to just process all that uh, data. And those platforms like uh, Discord or polis are also like external to the communication platforms like Discord. So not all members go there. It's hard to make them to, to, to go and share their uh, opinions there. So what we're building is basically combining large language model with conversational UX uh, to get to make decisions of higher quality and faster. And hopefully also they will become cheaper. Um, I really like the term collective dialogue system. Um, basically we use language model as an interface uh, or yeah, conversational UX to change the way people deliberate and make decisions. Um, and basically we increase human collective intelligence by increasing the bandwidth for that conversation and helping more people to speak up. So it works very simply. It's, you just start the instance on Discord. Uh, members join the, the, the instance and then start talking to the language model through the bot one-on-one. -on -one. And the bot can ask them additional questions and those questions can be different for each participant. And the questions are informed by what other participants are saying. So that basically you can, uh, people like comment or build upon each other's ideas. And finally, the bot shares, uh, synthesizes all that and shares a summary or proposal or something like a report, which shows like clusters of opinions. So I really like this quote, uh, continued progress toward the development and adoption of such systems could help revitalize democracies, reimagine corporate governance and transform conflict. Um, I really want to show it to you, but unfortunately you would have to join our test server, uh, which you can do by scanning the QR code right now. Uh, I don't think we have time for the demo, but if anyone is interested in checking out the the product like today, please uh, follow this link and I will personally facilitate a demo session for you. So I just wanted to add a few more words about the business model. We really want to build this as an open source software. I actually, I want to build this. Um, yeah, I don't know if I can call it a public good if we have premium features, but I, 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 ideally I really want as many communities to use it. And that's why we want to make it free for some like organizations, like community interest companies, or maybe cooperatives, uh, universities, but for large corporations, uh, like enterprise clients, uh, we want to offer like pro features, which might uh, include a lot of sessions per week or a lot of participants in one session, some kind of really useful prompts that might help them in their particular context. Um, and API integration with something like Jira. Plus we can have, uh, sorry, we can sell some services like using uh, Harmonica's uh, license, like sub-licensing our GPT license uh, or setting up um, like on-premise, uh, language model if the client is uh, concerned with security. And those features, uh, like maybe something related to security, can be really important for some of our um, customers. So speaking of our go-to-market go strategy, we decided to focus right now on a very niche um, market, which is venture clubs and, and angel networks. So if anyone here <laughs> has any relationship to venture clubs or, or angel networks, please 
reach out to me. I would love to talk to you about this. Um, after that, we want to try to uh, find product market fit with mutual and employee owned businesses, which I think include DAOs. And finally, maybe sometimes like next year, we can finally try to sell this uh, to large companies uh, like enterprise and so on. And finally, some sometimes in the future, which I really hope we'll be able to do is we'll try to use it uh, for like democratic dialogue or citizen engagement. So this is like very rough, very like work in progress, go to market strategy. That's basically it, I hope. Um, you yeah. haven't used Thanks. too much time. Brilliant. Thank you, Artem. That's great. Um, I'm going to move on. If anyone has any questions, please use the chat because I'm afraid we are running out of time. So I'm going to move quickly on to Stackles. If Ector is available, hi, Ector. Um, the floor is yours. Can we ask Ramon if he wants to? Oh, sorry. Ah, there you go. Can you? Yeah. We got it. Going, we got it. If we can try and keep it to sort of five to ten, that'd be amazing. Yeah, I do see my screen now. Yep. Okay, yeah, now it works. Sorry about that. Hello, everyone. Um, we are stackers, and we simplify the Web3 coordination experience. All of us are in Web3 space, and I believe Web3 is the future. But let's be honest with each other. What is it like to work in Web3 or contribute to a Web3 project? I am in this space since 2021. And as a contributor myself, I've struggled with confusing UX, link clutter. I try to bookmark everything, all the important links and separate folders in my browser. But it's not very organized and a good experience for me as a contributor. Trust me, I am trying very hard not to get scammed because even OGs have fallen into these traps. I do not know what to trust and what not to trust anymore. Onboarding is bad. People cannot navigate. And there's an actual financial risk of losing money to the scam rings. For example, RMDAO may be using Discord, Twitter, Telegram, GitHub, Notion, Link to Mint tokens, and several other tools and links that you can think of. How me as a contributor can know which one is legit and which one is not? Which one can I trust and which not? Is there a reliable single source of truth? It's not just a DAO problem or Web3 problem. Even the Web2 companies do not have a trusted UI for all the tools and links that they use especially because the existing solutions are not interoperable. They're not designed for open Web3 communities and they create silos. By silos, 
What do I mean? Uh, let's take example of Google Workspace. If you're using Google Workspace, it will not show you the tools that you use from Microsoft or any other company. We have experienced these pain points and have spoken to community members, to some of you, to develop a solution, which is a trustable UI that allows you to find all the tools and organizations such as r and users at one place. So Stackers is a trusted portal to find all the tools that you need and you can safely click on the links. As a member of RNDAO, I can access RNDAO space on my Stackers Chrome plugin and see all the relevant links here. And I can trust these links. It is a single source of truth for the RNDAO members. I know that if I click on these links, I would not get scammed. We do not have any direct competitors, but a few indirect competitors. But our USP is that we abide by two Web3 principles, principle of decentralization and interoperability, which is at the core of our solution and will always be. We have developed with this, this solution with the feedback from the community and we continue to ask for more feedback to improve it even further. How do we plan to make money? So we do have a basic version, which will be free from, for everyone. As Artem said, we also want to, this tool to be used by everyone, but we do have a standard version and premium version. And this is us. Um, we have the right skills and knowledge, and of course the mentorship as you see to deliver a great solution to the community. Thank you so much for joining us in our journey and stay safe. Amazing. Thank you, Hector. And great timing as well. Thank you. Um, Ramon, if you're still there and are, and are able to share your screen, I would love to hear about Meet with Wallet. I have uh, good and bad news. The, the bad news is I didn't have time to prepare something. The good news is that given that we don't have much time, I can just like show the product quickly and we are good to go. Uh, let me share my screen. Hopefully it will work as soon as I find between the 100 open windows here. There we go. So uh, what is Meet with Wallet? It's, it started as an alternative to Calendly, but tailored to Web3. And we want to evolve this to an alternative to like a Web3 calendar and a way to actually help people organize themselves when they are in groups. Nowadays, it's a product more tailored to one-on-one -on -one, uh, meetings. So just like Calendly, you create a calendar, you share, people can schedule meetings with you. The main difference is that first, it relies on Web3 technology so people can schedule using their, like create accounts and schedule meetings just using their regular wallets. And second, all information is private. Everything about the meeting, aside from like public things like the time uh, that you are meeting so we can block your calendar. Everything else is fully private and encrypted on the client side. So only people participating in the meeting can actually decrypt that information and know what is this about. We also support things like uh, token gating for scheduling the meetings. We want to enable people to request crypto payments for the meeting to be scheduled and things like that. But this is all still a little bit one-on-one, let's say. Now we want to evolve how to make uh, cross like big, not even big, like teams coordination a little bit easier. In order to do that, we are like researching and, and trying out a few hypotheses. One of them will be a Discord bot that allows you within your Discord server just to tag some people. And for those who, who have an account, we will search for the best time for people to like to meet and schedule the meeting for them. Uh, then we can evolve for things kind of similar to let us meet, although their approach is not wonderful because you always need like to check your 10 different calendars, find the times that you want to tag as open times and things like that. And we can do all of this automatically. First, because we also allow integration with as many calendars as you have. And this is your private information, right? When you share your Meet with Wallet calendar, 
all your empty available slots will be there for people to see, but they have no idea that you have other time calendars behind that or your email or anything else that you don't want to share uh, because Web3 people love anonymity as well. This is the high level of things uh, that Meet With Wallet is, is capable and what we are aiming for. And now I'm going to give like a super quick rundown of the product. So you can just go to meetwithwallet.xyz. Meet you have this like beautiful landing page. You will connect your wallet. You will go to your like meeting dashboard, let's say. You have your account details. What is the display name, like the description for your calendar? You can add optionally Twitter, Discord, and Telegram. You have subscriptions you can use for free, of course. And if you want the pro subscription where you can customize your link, uh, sync multiple calendars, uh, like have different types of notifications, not a single one, do the token gating, et cetera, et cetera. You can go for a pro subscription, which costs $30 a year. This is showing one just because we are on the staging uh, version. Then you set up your availabilities per day, uh, as many as you want. You can break like every time during lunchtime, I'm not available. And of course, based on your time zone, otherwise it, this wouldn't work. You can set different meeting types. So I want a meeting like half hour, a meeting of one hour. Uh, and for each of these types, you can like set a different description, a different link, the minimum notice time for someone to schedule the meeting, add or not a gate, uh, as I was mentioning, token gate for this type of meeting and many more things to come. Notification settings, for now we have email, Discord, or push notifications with VPNS, uh, and we can, or, or better, now it's called push protocol, and we can think on many other types of notification. The token gates, uh, and lastly, the connected calendars. We support Google, Office, iCloud, and WebDAV, which is an interface that most of the calendar, uh, like companies and protocols use. Then taking a look at the scheduling page, pretty similar to Calendly, as I was mentioning, you have like some basic information about this, this person's calendar. Here you can see the types of meetings that can be scheduled, information about this type of meeting. This one in particular uh, is blocked, is uh, gated by people having ANT, the Argo Network token. Uh, and you like as simple as come here, I say, I want to meet you at 1030. You can schedule with your wallet. You add your like a name that you want. Uh, what is this meeting about? We use Huddle 01. Thanks, sure but... how many of you are like know them, an alternative to Zoom, uh, but Web3 Taylor as well. But if you don't want, you just on toggle, put any custom meeting URL here. And for your like boomer friends that are not part of Web3, they can simply come and schedule as a guest by simply inserting their email and like meeting will still work the same way. Uh, this is it as a like super fast, like showcase of the product. As I mentioned, now we are working a little bit on this Discord bot as a POC and figure out how is this going to work? If this is really valuable, for sure, RNDAO will be the first server for us to try this out and many other interesting ideas to come along the way. If anyone Bravo. has any questions. That was incredible and a great time. Thank you so much. And that brings us three minutes before the top of the hour. <laughs> Does anybody have any burning questions that they haven't shared in the chat and they'd like to draw attention to? I think a lot of people have been answering directly there. I guess the tradition says hands up. But you can always steal the mic. Okay, well, I guess we must have done an amazingly effective job of answering everything as we went along. Um, I guess it remains for me to say thank you all for turning up. Um, I really enjoyed that. That was great to hear everybody's presentation. Sorry it was so short, but it was great to hear that rapid fire. And we we'll look forward to organizing again and seeing you again, uh, hopefully, who knows, in a month's time. Have a great weekend, everybody.